Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Carey here, and we're going to begin discussing Revelation 12 and 13, where God introduces us to the seven key players of the tribulation. And in this video, we're going to look at the woman, the great dragon, and the man-child. But before we jump into our topic, I want to take a moment and ask you to stand with me by subscribing to this channel. I know it sounds simple, but we have to stand together and let the world know that we believe that the Word of God is true and that we are living in prophetic times. It's easy. All you have to do is click the subscribe button on your screen. You know, there's an incredible passage in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32, that tells us that the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times that they were living in, and because of this, they knew exactly what they needed to do. And I believe that we need men and women today that will accept the call of God to walk in this same type of anointing. See, it's not enough to recognize that we live in a world of decay or a world of crisis or that there are troubled times that we're facing. We need the Spirit of God to open our eyes to the spirit war that's behind the trouble because the times that we are living in require God's people to rise up and stand as a voice of righteousness in the face of increasing wickedness. In fact, I can hear the voice of God saying in my spirit that it's time for my people to shake off every spirit of fear that has grabbed a hold of their heart. And it's time to stop living in fear when you see wickedness increase because I have called you and I have anointed you to be salt and to be light in the world that you're living in. And God says he's not left you helpless or weak or powerless in the face of great evil. And again, I hear the Spirit of God saying, shake off all fear and shake off uncertainty because you are not helpless and you are not weak and God's Word is powerful for the pulling down and the destruction of every demonic lie and stronghold from hell. I mean, I can hear this so clearly in my spirit as I was preparing this message and in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak right now to every spirit of fear and I command it to take its hands off God's people right now. I command it to let go of God's people who are watching this. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I say be free. Be free in your mind. Be free in your thoughts. Be free in your heart. And I break every demonic agenda that has set itself against your life. And I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over you and over your home. And I release angels to build a wall of protection over your life that no devil from hell can breach. And I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I need the tangible presence of God moving in my life. And I can tell you that the times that we're living in will consume you in its crisis and will overtake you with its problems unless you begin to push back in the spirit. So stop worrying about what other people are going to think when you start declaring the word of God over every problem in your life and start living in the authority that belongs to you because of what Jesus did on the cross. See, we have to be bold in these last days. We have to be strong in these last days. And we have to accept the fact that we live in a world of decay and God has called us to be salt or that preserving element within the world. And we live in a world of increasing darkness. And that's why God called us as believers to be light. Now, with that said, let's jump into our discussion for today. Revelation 12, verse 1 through 6 says this, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. 
And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, at this point in the book of Revelation, there are a few key things that are important to understand if you're going to see how Revelation 12 and 13 fit into the overall narrative of the tribulation. The first thing is this. God is eternal and he's infinite, meaning that from his vantage point, all the events concerning our world, past, present, and future, exist simultaneously, and they create a single story of redemption and judgment. Now, there's an interesting passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in verse 15 that illustrates the eternalness of God, and it says this, That which is has already been, and that what is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. Now, I know this is tough to wrap your head around because as humans, we view things through the lens of time because we're locked into time and we're limited to sorting the events and the characters of this world into the past and into the present with the future always being just outside of our reach. And the result is that our perspective is fundamentally linear, which creates an illusion of depth, but in the end, all of its characters and all of its events, past and present, converge into vanishing points, and even further, unless God reveals something to us, through the Holy Spirit, we have no way of truly knowing how the spirit world and the natural world are going to intersect to shape the future. My point being that when Jesus tells John in Revelation 1 to write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place, what he's telling John is that the past and the present and the future are not isolated from each other, nor are they disconnected. In fact, the connection between them is the story of redemption, and God is the only one that knows the end from the beginning. In other words, when God gave John the visions that comprise the book of Revelation, we can settle with absolute confidence that he knows exactly what he is talking about because he's always coming from your tomorrow. Now, the second thing is that Revelation 12 and 13 are a parenthetical insert into the tribulation narrative that explain the seven key spiritual characters and their connection to everything that takes place during the tribulation. Now, this is also significant because biblically the number seven represents a completeness or things that are perfect and the totality of an issue. And in the biblical interpretation, there's something that's called the law of first mention. We've talked about it in past videos, but I'll mention it again here. It's the law of first mention, meaning that the very first time something is used in the Bible, the significance given to it is critical in understanding its meaning throughout the entirety of Scripture. And the number seven gains a large part of its meaning from Genesis chapter two, where God is presented to us as the creator, having absolute dominion and authority over everything. So its implication is no different in Revelation 12 and 13. I mean, think about it. In our text, there are seven key players who are the spiritual influence behind 
everything that happens during the tribulation as the world is being pushed towards the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Meaning that by right of creation, God has a complete and total and perfect authority in and over all of these things. In other words, uh, absolutely nothing happens during the tribulation without God allowing it or even orchestrating it. It's also important to note that from the perspective of timing, these two chapters are part of the greater vision that God gave to the Apostle John beginning in Revelation 4 and extending all the way through Revelation 22, which means that they are these, these characters are running in a parallel manner throughout the tribulation. Now, let's go back to our text and begin looking at the first three characters mentioned, the woman the dragon, and the male child. Revelation 12, picking up in verse 1, says this, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, these symbols are taken directly from the Old Testament. In fact, all the characters and symbolism in Revelation 12 and 13 are taken directly from Old Testament prophecy. What I mean is that they're not strange, they're not random, and they're not intended to be cryptic. In fact, when, when the Holy Spirit revealed this to John, the intention would be that you understand it and that you know exactly what he's talking about. And this becomes incredibly clear if you allow the Bible to speak for itself. Now, in this passage, the Apostle John tells us that he saw a great sign in heaven, which was the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. The first thing I want you to notice about this is that John calls the woman a great sign. In other words, this is something that is incredibly supernatural that we need to pay attention to. The woman in this passage represents Israel, and God is telling us that Israel itself is an incredible sign. Now, I want to show you this. Take a look at Joseph's dream back in Genesis chapter 37, uh, beginning in verse 9. It says this, Then he, and it's speaking of Joseph, dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look! I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him. Now this is interesting. His father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. See, the symbolism is clear. The sun, the moon, and the 12 stars in our passage represent Israel. Even further, the picture of Israel as a woman, as the picture of Israel as a woman in labor is used over and over again in the Old Testament. In fact, let me give you a couple of illustrations uh, from Isaiah and from uh, the book of Jeremiah. Isaiah 26, 17 says this, as a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pangs when she draws near to the time of her delivery, so have we, speaking of Israel, been in your sight, O Lord. Now, Jeremiah 4.31 says this, For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor, the anguish as of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion, bewailing herself, she spreads her hands, saying, Woe is me, for my soul is weary because of murderers. Now, 
In the context of this passage, the prophet Jeremiah declares that Israel will be like a woman crying out in labor because the judgment of God is going to consume her because of her sin, and that when the idolatrous nations around her attack, they're not going to show an ounce of mercy or compassion. So the Bible makes it clear that the woman giving birth in Revelation 12 represents the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. But you're going to hear arguments on this when you study Bible prophecy. In fact, there are people who believe that this passage is talking about the church, that the woman is the church, which doesn't make an ounce of sense to me uh, because, I, I mean, think about it. Israel birthed Christ. And this passage describes the great struggle that's accompanied that promise and its fulfillment. Now, we're not talking about the church. And to emphasize my point, the church has nothing to do with the birth of Christ. In fact, it only exists because of Christ and his birth. Not to mention that if you read Matthew chapter 1, uh, you find that the natural genealogy of Jesus literally begins with Abraham, continues through David, and ends with Joseph and Mary. In other words, Jesus is not only Jewish, he's completely embedded into the entire fabric of Israel itself. And in Romans 9, beginning in verse 4, the Apostle Paul tells us that the glory of God and all of his blessings came to us through Israel. In fact, we wouldn't be living in the new covenant or even understand the goodness and grace of God if it wasn't for Israel. And he tops off his argument by reminding us that the human ancestry of Jesus comes directly from the Old Testament patriarchs. Now, it, which, which means that there is no, that, that the woman in Revelation 12, she is not the church the woman in Revelation 12 represents the nation of Israel. Now, let's keep moving through our text. Revelation 12, picking up in verse 3, says this. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Again, John refers to this as a great sign or something that's incredibly supernatural that we need to pay attention to. And there's no doubt that this great fiery red dragon is talking about Satan, because if you go down to verse 9, uh, it tells us directly that the dragon was cast out, that serpent of old is called the devil and Satan. So uh, the dragon here in this passage is the devil. But as far as symbolism goes, the dragon's seven heads with a crown on each head or a picture of his wisdom, and the ten horns represent the global power over this world system that he has. And the reminder that a third of the angels were swept from heaven when he fell shows us the incredible extent of his demonic forces. And these images are taken directly, again, from the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 7, when he describes the second coming of Christ and the destruction of the great beast with the ten horns who consumes the entire world into his single kingdom. And when you understand the parallel between these passages, you realize that Satan himself is the power behind the Antichrist. He's the power behind the Antichrist's one world government and he's the power behind the attempt to annihilate the Jewish people during the second half of the tribulation in a final attempt to shut down Bible prophecy and stop the return of the Lord. Now, 
On a side note, I think that a lot of people have a very wrong perspective of who Satan is. They see him as some distorted and grotesque monster running around hell with a pitchfork, which is a completely inaccurate picture. In our text in Revelation 12, it describes him as a great fiery red dragon whose tail swept a third of the angels out of heaven when he was cast down. And Ezekiel 28 describes him this way. It says this, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And I cast you to the ground and laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Now the truth is, even in his fallen state, Lucifer is an imposing and formidable angelic being who appears as an angel of light. The New Testament tells us that he is the God of this world, that he's the prince of the power of the air, and that his battle for the control of this world isn't going to end until he's judged and cast into the lake of fire. Now, let's finish out our text for today. Revelation 12, 5 says this, she, speaking of Israel, bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, this is clearly talking about Christ, and the picture comes from Psalm chapter 2, where the Messiah is given the nations as an inheritance from his father. Psalm 2, verse 7 through 9 says this, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall dash them like pieces, like a potter's vessel. Now, interestingly, our text in Revelation tells us that before Christ rules the nations, that he was caught up to God and caught up to his throne. Now, this is referring to his ascension in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, and the phrase caught up in this passage is the exact same phrase that's used to describe the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17, which says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. It's the exact same phrase. Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now our passage ends with Revelation 12, 6, which says this, then the woman fled into the wilderness. She has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, which is referring to the last three and a half years of the tribulation where Israel suffers overwhelming persecution uh, at the hand of the Antichrist, which fulfills Jesus' prophecy in Matthew chapter 25, I mean, Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 15, when it says this, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothing, but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect, speaking of Israel, for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. What a heart-wrenching and terrifying passage. 
I mean, Jesus is saying that the moment that the Antichrist steps foot into the tribulation temple and declares himself to be God, that all of his hatred for God's chosen people, the elect, will be poured out with so much force that they won't even have the time to make a single preparation. They simply need to run and hide themselves in the mountains uh, in and around Israel or they're going to die. And Jesus plainly says that there's never been an attack against the Jewish people like the one that will take place at this point of the tribulation. And that unless those days are shortened, that the Jewish people will be completely annihilated. Now, this feels like a good place to stop for today. And I realize that the things we've been talking about are weighty and they're serious but be at peace because we are not living in the tribulation hour. We are living in the time of grace. We're living in a window in time where God is reaching out with all of his goodness and all of his mercy and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, will be saved. Second Corinthians 6 tells us this, we strongly urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says at the acceptable time of grace, I listened to you and I helped you in the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Well, let's stop there. But before you go, I want to speak a blessing over your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Well, God bless, and I look forward to seeing you next time.